The Rigel Black Chronicles, Book One, The Pure Blood Pretense. Chapter 10. On Sunday, optimism turned to creativity. Rigel left her two roommates dozing behind their velvet hangings and stole through the dungeons up to the basement where she meant to enact a plan that had come to her in the night. Even if she hadn't already passed it on one of her walks with Pansy, the still-life portrait, several times her size, was hard to miss. The map was clear about what to do next, a tiny figure tickling a pair perniciously, but Rigel still looked over her shoulder in silent embarrassment as she stretched out her right hand and copied its movements. The pair giggled, which was rather more startling than the requirement to tickle it, and Rigel thought she saw it grow an eye and wink at her before the portrait swung inwards. Creeped out or not, Rigel had to grin. The map was a priceless resource, the ethics of stalking the castle's every inhabitant aside. Unexpectedly, and in flagrant disregard to the probabilities of architecture, the kitchens were at least as big as the Great Hall. Taking in the five long tables, situated in exactly the same manner as the student and staff tables, Rigel realised the kitchens must be directly beneath the Great Hall, and that food arranged on the tables below was somehow transferred vertically up through the ceiling. Also unexpectedly, the kitchens that morning were even noisier than the Great Hall during meal times, which Rigel wouldn't have thought possible. Pots and pans whisked from surface to surface, clanging and occasionally crashing into one another. A huge fireplace roared impressively when its grate was opened, and she saw pans and baking dishes levitating over the flames. Rhythmic chopping and slicing noises came from a factory line of elves with cutting boards, and timers seemed to go off every few seconds, blending together in a chorus that Rigel would have found impossible to keep straight. Yet, woven through the chaos, there was order, or at least some kind of plan. The elves danced around one another, indifferent to the near misses with sharp knives and boiling hot sauces. The intricate pageantry would have taken humans years to even choreograph, much less attempt to execute. Rigel stood uncomfortably to the side, intimidated by the overwhelming sense of purpose in the room. Who was she, with no instrument or part, to interrupt the symphony before her? She watched and waited for a natural break in the flow. Within a couple minutes, and to no cue that Rigel could perceive, a house elf with a pink tea cosy around her waist broke from the ranks. A necklace of champagne corks bobbed around her neck as the house elf approached Rigel with a wide smile. Hello, young sir. The house elf's voice was squeakier than Rigel had expected. She'd never met a house elf in person, though she had seen their stuffed heads mounted on plaques in the attic at Grim Old Place. As the house elf curtsied gracefully, Rigel wiped the image from her mind. We is very sorry for the wait. What can Binny be doing for you? Hi, Binny. Rigel crouched down so she was on Binny's level. I don't want to bother you if you're busy making breakfast, but I was hoping someone here could help me with something. Binny is not busy. Binny is on her... The house elf moved her face closer, whispering, break, like it was a filthy word. I wouldn't want to take up your break, Rigel said uncertainly. Binny's luminous gaze drew her in, her wide eyes imploring. House elves did not seem to need to blink as often as humans. Please, young sir, the headmaster is making us take breaks from cooking every hour, but you is not needing help cooking, is you? No. The elf put her hands together with a smile. Then Binny is helping you. Rigel had to smile back. I won't tell Dumbledore if you won't. Binny made an exaggerated zipping motion across her lips, bouncing on her toes excitedly. Rigel had to remind herself the house elf was probably much older than she was. I need to disguise myself. Not for anything bad, she added, seeing Binny's look of dismay. I'm not going to break any school rules, but I need a uniform that doesn't have a Slytherin crest on it. Binny frowned dejectedly into Rigel's face. We is not supposed to be helping students with mischief. It's not even for mischief, Rigel promised. I'm going to use it to study. 
Binny stared at Rigel for a long moment, her pupils dilating and contracting. You is telling the truth. Then, can you help me? Rigel looked around the room. You all do the laundry, right? Can I borrow another student's outer robe if I bring it back before tonight so it can be returned? Binny shook her head fiercely, her ears flapping. No, 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 we's not giving you other students' clothes. Rigel grimaced. I understand. I wouldn't want to get you into trouble. Binny bounced nervously from foot to foot, then froze. A look of fearful enlightenment dawned across her expressive face. She darted quick, wide-eyed glances at the other house elves, none of whom were looking their way, then whispered, Is you losing one of your robes? What? You is! Binny exclaimed loudly, and Rigel jumped with surprise. If you is losing a robe, you is coming with me. The lost and found is being right through here. Binny pitched her voice above the clanking dishes and winked broadly at Rigel before taking off through the melee. Rigel scrambled to keep up, ducking platters of food and jumping bowls of punch as she followed Binny to a door on the other side of the kitchens. They emerged in a much quieter room, which was dominated by huge vats of water and lined on every side by labelled laundry bins. There had to be at least one for each dormitory in the whole school. Binny waved her toward the right side of the room where a large bin, nearly overflowing with clothes, stood on its own. It was labelled Lost and Found. Here you is. Binny grinned triumphantly up at her. Since you is wanting to find some robes, maybe you is losing them first. There's being all kinds of lost things in here, and maybe you is finding something you is losing in here. Yes, young sir. Rigel grinned back at Binny. Yes, how silly of me. I'm sure I lost something I need to find in here. Thank you, Binny. She surveyed the bin critically. In the top layer alone, she could see everything from Quidditch uniforms to high-heeled shoes. It was perfect. Best if you is taking anything you is finding, Binny warned her. If you is coming back for it later, it is maybe not being here. Do people usually come back for their things then? Rigel didn't like the idea of stealing something someone actually wanted. Oh no, Binny shook her head for emphasis. No one is ever coming for these things, but they is going sometimes. Going where? Rigel asked, curious now despite herself. Uh, to the room of lost things, Binny said. If it is being lost for long enough, or if it is being lost on purpose, it sometimes is going to that room. How can you lose something on purpose? Rigel wondered aloud. Maybe you is not wanting to be finding it again. Binny shrugged bony shoulders. Or not wanting anyone else to find it? Rigel tilted her head. It sounds like a room for hiding things. Hiding or losing, if you is wanting to find something from the bin, you is not wanting it to go there, is you? Binny's logic was indisputable. I suppose not. Thank you, Binny. You've been really helpful. You is most welcome. Binny turned her head to a sound Rigel didn't catch. Binny is going back to work now. I is wishing you luck with your finding, young sir. Binny left for the kitchen on a glad skip, and Rigel eyed the lost and found bin determinedly. Maybe Pince would bar Rigel Black from her library, but she did not check the identity of every student who entered. If she found a good enough disguise, she could finish Flint's homework that afternoon. Sorting through the bin took some time. No matter what Binny said about items lost for long enough disappearing, Rigel found pieces of clothing that must have been in the laundry room for years, not only out-of-date uniforms, but hoop skirts, coat tails, bowlers and blazers. By the time she reached the bottom of the bin, she had enough items in her size for several disguises. Rigel took one school robe from each of the other three houses, complete with house crests on the chest pockets and coloured ties to match. She found a pair of glasses that were just a little crooked and three wigs from a selection of eight that she could only wonder at the purpose of. She had one shaggy red-headed wig that was curly around the ends and a mousy brown wig with pin-straight ear-length hair. The third, a girl's wig with blunt bangs and long, blonde hair that was neatly braided, would be a last resort. She gathered her spoils together under one arm and tried to figure out how to get them back into the dorms without anyone noticing. By that time, her two observant roommates were probably awake. 
Rigel struck inspiration when she examined the laundry bins lining the room. The nearest was labelled Ravenclaw 4G1. She peered inside, feeling vaguely uncomfortable, and saw that it was separated inside. There were five segments in the bin, and all of them had female accoutrements mixed in with the generic school robes. If she had designed the labelling system, that would make it the first bin for the fourth-year Ravenclaw girls. Rigel made her way around the room until she came to the bin that read Slytherin 1B2. Inside, there were three segments, and in one of them, she recognised Archie's golden boxer shorts. They really would have to have a talk about his taste in underclothes when she got home for winter break. She kept the Gryffindor robes and tie and the red-headed wig and glasses. She stuffed the rest down into her section of the laundry bin, along with the two extra wigs. If the house elves worked their usual magic, they would be folded neatly in her trunk by the time she got back to the room that evening. Rigel lifted her good hand to Binny in thanks as she passed back through the kitchens. Binny winked cheerfully at her from behind a towering bowl of strawberries and told her to come back and visit soon. Rigel pushed the spare robe into her book bag, grateful for the undetectable extension charm Sirius had added. She didn't know what he'd assumed Archie would use the extra room for, but it was suspiciously convenient for carrying curiously shaped or bulky objects without notice. She climbed the steps to the Great Hall and found many of the dishes she'd seen prepared just moments earlier, waiting for her at the Slytherin table. The basket of strawberries in particular seemed to twinkle at her. She rushed through breakfast, not giving anyone a chance to ask her where she'd been or why her left hand stayed firmly in her lap. As long as she kept her mouth full, her classmates were too polite to pose any questions. As soon as she downed her glass of juice, she took off again, determined to finish those essays before lunch. Rigel changed in the bathroom closest to the library. The fewer people who saw her wandering the halls disguised as a student that didn't exist, the better. She swapped robes and wetted her hair to slick it back. The wig was almost impossible manage one-handed, and the heart-jolting fear that someone could walk in at any moment and question her made it all the harder. She made a face at the feel of the tight, scratchy underside pressing against her wet scalp, Perhaps eventually she could learn a spell to change her hair colour instead. When it was settled, a Gryffindor boy with flat grey eyes and messy red hair looked back at her from the mirror. She thought she looked a bit like a Weasley, if a person squinted or had very poor eyesight. She could only pray Pince's mental catalogue of the castle students wasn't nearly as accurate as the one she had for its books. The large, round glasses sat oddly on her nose. They were nothing like the practical pair she'd used before the contacts, but she was grateful they were costume and not prescription. Although ridiculous, they didn't compete with her corrected vision. In a moment of indulgence, she rooted in her bag for a pot of ink. After watering down a small amount in her palm, she dabbed it across her nose and cheeks with the point of her quill. The sight of her reflection made her chuckle, and for a moment she missed Archie fiercely. He would delight in the sheer silliness of the situation. Her cousin could be counted on to see the fun in everything, even difficulties, and she suspected she would have been a more serious person without his influence. Too late for that now. With a final grin at the boy in the mirror, she slunk from the bathroom in a posture that probably looked as awkward as it felt. Shaking her head at herself, she muttered, Don't overthink it. Settling into an unobtrusive shuffle, she ducked into the library with her face averted carefully from the librarian's desk. The library was still quiet, the procrastination-prone students not yet under enough pressure to haunt its stacks. She made a beeline toward the history section and found the books on the 16th century right where she left them. It took two trips to get all three to a table one-handed, but no one looked twice at her. The thick, cheap lenses in the costume glasses immediately annoyed her eyes. She slipped them low on her nose and read over the top so she didn't give herself a headache. The wig was itchy, but she dared not scratch at it, and strands of red hair kept falling into her line of sight, making her twitch with surprise. Still, she finished the history essay. 
There were a number of books on Venomous Tentacula in the Herbology section, and she found one with a coloured illustration that she tried copying onto blank parchment to satisfy the diagram portion of Flint's assignment. When she leaned back to judge the final effect of her attempt, her lips twisted in instinctive disgust. Merlin. But she was not an artist. Her rendition of the plant looked remarkably like the giant squid, and neither had been improved by the hybridization. It was the tentacles, they defied perspective, and it didn't help that the illustration kept moving. Rigel crumpled her pitiful attempt into a ball and tapped her fingers against the table agitatedly. She couldn't mail the essay back without the diagram, but she felt foolish wasting her time trying to draw such a complicated plant. She glanced at Madame Pince and found her looming over a cowering Ravenclaw, gesticulating aggressively at the dog-eared corner of a page in his Transfiguration textbook. It would be unwise to be caught defacing a book, but she dripped the tiniest dot of ink onto the page. It welled and didn't seep. Rigel smirked. If she were the librarian, she'd put waterproofing charms on all the books, too. Rigel slid her book bag over on the table to block Madame Pince's view of the book. With her left elbow braced on the spine, she slowly and carefully traced the lines of the book's illustration in ink. The ink sat wetly on top of the page, and the illustration froze underneath it, as though the plant in the picture could feel the nib of her quill. When she'd gone over all the major lines, she lowered parchment down onto the wet page. The ink soaked into the parchment perfectly, and when she pulled it away, she had a rough tracing. Rigel blotted the page with the edge of her stolen robes, leaving it to dry completely before she shut the book. Relief seeped just like the ink through her veins, and she finished the assignment with neat labels around the edges of the scroll. The rest of Flint's homework went faster. The Herbology and Potions essays were the longest, but she knew far more about those topics, so it was the work of two hours to finish them both. As she scattered drying sand on the last of her words, she wondered why she was putting so much effort into the older boy's work. Anyone who asked a first year to do their assignments could not possibly care about the quality with which they were completed. She packed up her things one-handed and silently admitted that it was half guilt and half hope. Part of her felt as though she deserved the extra work. She had lied to everyone to get there, to her family, to her new friends. It made sense, on a twisted level, that her path should be harder than the others. The part of her that needed to make up for what she'd done didn't even resent the blackmail. It was a sort of penance and it made her feel in a way that she could quietly admit was a bit sad, as though she'd earned back whatever moral fibre she lost in all the secrets and lies. Then there was the hopeful half. She couldn't deny the Slytherin side of her that understood the principle of reciprocity either. If she did a good enough job, then, whether he wanted to or not, Flint would have to feel a little beholden to her. Maybe it would be enough to keep him quiet in the years to come. Rigel tore off her red-headed disguise in the nearest bathroom, but it didn't make any difference. Beneath it was just a different disguise, and that one she could never take off. Minus zero. Rigel braved the steep outer steps to the Owlery, determined to send Flint's assignments off and be done with them for the week. She would spend the rest of the day with Pansy and Draco, if they let her. That, too, was a kind of penance. The wind tore at her clothes and hair. She tucked her chin into her collar and squinted to keep her contacts from drying out. In doing so, she sacrificed much of her line of sight, and she didn't see the girl coming round the corner down the stairs until Rigel had run smack into her. They both gasped as they fell sideways into the railing, Rigel with muted agony as her left wrist jostled and the other girl with surprise. The railing was strong, not even shaking as it took the full brunt of their weight, but the other girl made a noise of terror and reached for Rigel desperately. Rigel twisted so her left arm was out of her reach and braced her right arm on the girl's shoulder. They both took several calming breaths and Rigel unclenched her teeth as the throbbing in her broken wrist quiesced to a level ache. Are you all right? 
Rigel leaned her head back just in time to escape being swiped by blonde pigtails as the girl looked sharply up at her. I think so. The girl still had her fists clenched around Rigel's robes. Her legs gave out without warning and she sat hard on the steps, pulling Rigel down with her. Rigel grunted as her knees hit the stair and the blonde girl flashed dismayed eyes at her. Sorry? She released Rigel's robes and straightened her black and yellow tie with shaking fingers, but made no move to stand. Her breath was coming a little too quickly. That's all right. We're OK, aren't we? The girl sniffed woefully. Yes, I'm so sorry. I wasn't looking where I was going, and then I thought we were going to die just now. The railing is probably reinforced, Rigel offered. The other girl nodded miserably, setting her pigtails to swaying. Slytherin had a couple of classes with Hufflepuff, and Rigel thought she recognised the other first year now. It's Abbott, right? Rigel clambered to her feet and offered the Hufflepuff her good hand. Hannah, the girl confirmed, levering herself up with Rigel's help. I'm Rigel Black. The girl's eyes went straight to her green and silver tie as though she had only just noticed it. She paled and took a half step back into the railing she had been so afraid of moments before. I... I didn't mean to, Black. It was an accident. Rigel tried to soften her gaze into something reassuring. I know, I'm not upset as long as you're all right. Abbott still looked somewhat miserable, but she no longer seemed terrified, at least. Oh, no, I mean, yes, I'm fine. The girl had a sizable scrape on her leg from where it had slid into the railing, actually, and Rigel felt the knife of sympathy prick her conscience, not for the first time. She was glad she didn't have to wear a skirt with her uniform. Do you want me to walk you to the hospital wing? She would go no further than the doors, but she could show the other girl where it was, at least. Um, Abbott looked confused, as though Rigel might be joking. Her cheeks took on a bit of pink, and Rigel was relieved she was getting some of her colour back after their scare, at least. I'll just ask one of my housemates. Rigel nodded, inwardly relieved that Abbott hadn't taken her up on her offer. She had no desire to climb all those stairs again. Be careful the rest of the way down. I will! Abbott gave her one last searching look and hurried past her down the stairs, pigtails flying behind her in the wind. Right. Rigel blew out a sigh and adjusted her bag on her shoulder. It was uncharitable for her to think so, considering her own sex but girls were a little weird. She chose a nondescript school owl to carry Flint's essays, which she stacked and rolled together as if they were one thick letter. That chore finally completed, Rigel took the stairs back down to the seventh floor, this time with her eyes wide open despite the wind. For each stair she descended, her mood seemed to lift. With homework settled and the first week finally behind her, she could take a moment to appreciate how many things had gone right. Here she was, a half-blood at Hogwarts, studying under the brightest mind in her prospective field. She'd made it a whole week without anyone noticing a thing. What was an injured wrist or a little blackmail when balanced against that success? She reached the main stairway complex and waited a few moments for a set of stairs to move over to the seventh floor landing. There was already a staircase waiting on the sixth floor landing and she was just starting down the second set of stairs when one disappeared out from under her. Rigel dropped straight down, breath caught on a yell, foot unable to find purchase, hand missing the railing by scant inches, and in the same disorienting instant a jet of hot air whistled over her head in a confusion of red light. Stone jaws clamped down on her left thigh, and air hissed out of clenched teeth. Her remaining leg and good arm braced against the stairs above and below, and she stared in stunned dismay at the stone mouth that had once been a stare. The sound of muffled laughter from one of the landings above made her breath freeze in her chest for a different reason. The red light. Someone had tried to hex her again, only they missed when she hit the trick stair instead. Rigel tried to twist around to see who it was, but her elbow slipped and she sank another few inches into the trap. She gritted her teeth and clenched all her muscles to keep herself still, bracing for whatever attack came next. None came. 
the staircase began to move again, sending her bag tumbling down another two steps, and she craned her neck to see where the laughter had come from. She heard slow footsteps above and behind her, as though whoever it was kept pace with the moving stair to remain in her blind spot. If only she could see, she would not feel so utterly helpless. Her staircase ground to a halt when it met the fifth-floor landing, and the footsteps above paused. The clunking sound of something small hitting a stone step behind her made her flinch. The thing rolled down two steps, and Rigel curled away from it, imagining the worst. It hit her in the side of the head and exploded into a cloud of putrid air. The stench filled her nostrils and she coughed, then gagged on it. A stink bomb, she realised as her eyes began to stream. Over the sound of her own violent sneezing, she heard the footsteps moving fast away from the scene. Rigel wished she could flee, or at least push the dung bomb the rest of the way down the stairs, but she couldn't move her limbs without sinking up to her crotch in the trap. She craned her neck as far away from the stink bomb as she could and tried to breathe unaffected air, but there didn't seem to be any. She wanted to puke. More than that, she wanted to curse whatever sick strain of luck had landed her in that predicament. The map didn't say anything about a trick stair on one of the main staircases. She wasn't sure if she should feel grateful the trap had saved her from that hex, or resentful it had left her a sitting duck for what came next. Rigel could not afford another fall, not with her wrist still healing, but she didn't fancy being stuck there with dung bomb in her hair until someone came back from lunch either. A harsh bark of laughter came from above, and for a moment she thought her assailant was back. Then she recognised it. You've got the natural survivability of a toothless viper, kid. Heavy footsteps marked his progress down the stairs, and Flint strolled into her peripheral vision with a smirk. He mimed, holding his nose as he took an exaggerated step over the trick stair her leg was caught in. That's how it's done, in case you were wondering, he drawled from the stair below her. Rigel bared her teeth in a grimace at him. How nice to see you, Flint, she panted. Flint gave her a mean grin. Likewise, running into you just cheers me up somehow. Rigel sighed, but it sounded more desperate than exasperated as it hissed through her teeth. Will you please help me out of here? Can't get yourself out. He put his hands in his pockets and pretended to examine her situation by tilting his head at various angles. I'm not strong enough to pry the trap apart. Not with only one hand, and not while trying to keep herself from sinking further into it. Her right arm and leg were shaking from the effort of just keeping herself where she was. Flint considered this silently for a moment, then his shrewd gaze fell on her cradled left hand. With a dark smile, he held out his own hand toward her. Take it then, I'll pull you out. Rigel set her face in a scowl as his fingertips dangled before her eyes tauntingly. I can't. Even if she released her right hand from its braced position, she wouldn't be able to take it fast enough to avoid the trap swallowing her. Her left hand wasn't an option, and she was pretty sure he had guessed as much by the way his smirk only widened. Can you just pry open the stair? Or better yet, disable the trap? Flint only laughed. And how do you propose I do that? Ask the castle nicely? Sometimes there's a switch on the underside of the railings near a trick step, Rigel told him. Flint gave her a hard look that said she shouldn't have known that, but he did bend at the waist and make a show of checking both railings. No such luck. With a winkle of his nose, he hastily stood upright again. Pa, you stink, Black. I'm not so sure I can get close enough to open the stair without hurling on you. Didn't take you for a weak stomach, Rigel snapped. At his raised eyebrows, she forced her expression into something less mutinous. It wasn't as though anyone else had come along to help. Please, Flint. Hmm. Flint rolled up his robe sleeves. You owe me an extra credit assignment for this. Relief turned her agreement into a sigh. Deal. Flint crouched and firmly gripped both sides of the trick stair. He heaved against the mechanism, and the stone shuddered in protest, but the two sides of the vice slowly inched back. 
When she had enough clearance to pull her leg free, Rigel summoned the dregs of her energy and pushed herself up and out with a pained grunt. She collapsed on the stair below, breathing hard, her injured wrist held protectively to her front. As soon as she was free, Flint allowed the trap to snap back into place with a sickening thud. Thanks, Rigel said tiredly. She shook out the aching muscles in her limbs as best she could and retrieved her bag from where it had fallen several steps down. Don't mention it. Flint fixed her with a menacing look. To anybody. Once she'd nodded her agreement, Flint indicated the spent dung bomb with a jerk of his chin. What was that about, trying to send up a smoke signal? Rigel scowled at him. It's not mine. He let out a sharp sound of amusement. Someone less kind than me found you first? Aren't many who meet that standard in this school. You really do have shit luck. Rigel bent to pick up the stink bombshell so no one else would slip on it. She pocketed it without looking at Flint. What are you doing up here anyway? Isn't everyone at lunch? This is the way to the Owlery, isn't it? Rigel nodded slowly. That thing I owe you is in the mail. Better and better. Flint began to move past her, and at the last second he moved to check her with his right shoulder. Rigel flinched away, holding her left arm protectively, and Flint let a nasty smile bloom on his face again. What happened to your arm, unlucky snake? Goodbye, Flint. His laughter followed her down the stairs. Minus zero. Returning to the common room, Rigel felt like a soldier coming home from a war that she'd lost. Her limbs trembled with fatigue, her brain felt stuffed with wool, and something about being attacked twice in one week had shriveled her heart into a pile of wilted greens. Pansy rose from a low couch to greet her, but her smile vanished when her nose got within range. You, Rigel, you smell like dragon dung. Your friendship is truly a balm to my soul. Pansy grimaced sympathetically, wafting at the air around Rigel's head somewhat ineffectually. I was going to introduce you to some people today, but that will have to wait. Even friendship has its limits. Sorry to spoil your plans, I got caught with a dung bomb from behind. Pansy made a disapproving noise in the back of her throat. She sounded a little like Lily in that moment. Throwing dung bombs at a first year, who would stoop so low? Forgive me for saying so, but it smells as though it landed in your hair. Rigel couldn't smell it anymore, but she could imagine. It did, actually. I'm going to need a whole bottle of shampoo to get it out, aren't I? Pansy met her eyes carefully. I'm not sure you'll be able to, unless whatever was wrong with your left hand earlier is fixed. Rigel stared at her. Pansy's face softened. I won't ask. Just don't mistake us for fools. Come on, I'll help you wash your hair. Pansy marched her across the common room with a hand between Rigel's shoulder blades. When they turned down the first-year offshoot, Rigel was going to tell Pansy she wasn't allowed in her room, but Pansy walked straight past her own dorm and headed for Rigel's. Pansy knocked twice, then threw open the door and walked right in. Pansy! Draco's voice was half-squawk. What in Salazar's name are you? Rigel! Draco stood, the book in his lap, falling to the coverlet. Is something ro Oh, Merlin! He clapped a hand to his nose and glared in horrified affront at them over his fingers. What is that smell? Awful, isn't it? Pansy breezed past the choking boy and towed Rigel into the bathroom. Rigel got hit with a dung bomb, and he needs help washing it out. She took a moment to observe the state of their bathroom, then asked in a neutral tone, Do the house elves even clean in here? Draco spluttered a defence from his bed. Not on weekends! The words came out muted, as he still had his nose in a death grip. Pansy poked her head back into the room and gave Draco a stern look. I'm sure a Malfoy doesn't flinch from something as harmless as an unpleasant odour. Which of these bottles is shampoo? No, Rigel. Pansy held up a hand as Rigel made to point it out. Please move as little as humanly possible. Draco gave Rigel a look that said he was questioning the value of their continued friendship but he did manfully slide off the bed and confer with Pansy over which combination of scents and scouring agents would be most effective in dealing with the dead niffler that rotted on Rigel's head. Armed with gloves, towels and what appeared to be every bottle of soap in the bathroom, Pansy and Draco herded Rigel to the sink like she was a hazmat risk. 
When Draco okayed the water temperature, Pansy pushed Rigel's head forward until she was leaning over the deep basin, her hair directly under the tap. Rigel screwed up her eyes so her contacts didn't get rinsed out. It was a strange feeling, having two sets of hands alternately pulling and scrubbing at her hair, and she had to tense her neck muscles to keep her head in generally the same spot under the opposing forces. But twenty minutes later, they released her. Rigel rubbed at her wet hair with a towel one-handed as Draco and Pansy disposed of the gloves. I can't smell it any more, but that might be because my brain turned off that sense in self-defence, Draco said. Pansy's grimace said she rather agreed. We've done all we can for the moment, but we might need a third opinion before he's fit for human company. Her scalp was raw and her neck sore, but her nose didn't burn any more, so she thanked the blonde duo with her face averted in embarrassment. Draco waved a hand dismissively. It's our noses we were saving. And that's what friends are for. Pansy took a deep, satisfied breath. This deserves celebration. Wait here. Pansy was back in moments with a large pink tin which she set in the middle of Draco's bedspread. She perched on the end of his mattress, feet on his trunk, and waited until Draco and Rigel had awkwardly clambered onto either side of the bed to open the tin with a flourish. It was full of biscuits. My grandmother sent them this morning. Pansy told Rigel. You rushed off so quickly you missed the post. Draco picked two from the tin instantly, with a decisiveness that said he had got a look earlier and knew exactly which ones he wanted. Pansy waited until Rigel had taken a round shortbread with a jam centre before selecting a lemon shrewsbury for herself. You should take a few, Rigel. Grandmother is an accomplished baker and you missed lunch again. Rigel smiled and nearly swallowed her first biscuit whole. She was so hungry. Draco made an indignant sound that was muffled by the biscuit in his mouth. He gestured to the crumbs she had spilled on his bedspread, and Rigel picked each one off and ate it, licking her fingers for effect. The other two laughed, and Draco rolled his eyes as he flopped back against his pillows to get more comfortable. They ate biscuits until the tin was empty, and even then they lingered in one another's company. As Pansy and Draco chatted about the people they knew and the classes they liked or disliked so far, Rigel thought it was the first time she'd felt truly comfortable around them, as though some stilted barrier between them had been dismantled. The barrier was on her end, she realised slowly. She had finally let her guard down enough to just exist with them as people, instead of treating them as adversaries in a game only she was playing. They were funny, which she had already known, but she hadn't let herself properly enjoy that about them until now. They were observant, too, picking apart their classmates' personalities and abilities with devastating insight. Rigel adjusted the sleeve on her left arm and thought she would be lucky to have them on her side, come to that. When it was time to go to dinner, they walked together, sat together. Half full from the biscuits, the three of them shared a secret smile when their housemates asked why they weren't eating much. She felt included, part of a whole similar to being home with Archie, but even easier because she could check out from time to time and the other two would go right on with the conversation without her. Unknowingly, they had given her exactly what she needed after a long week, and in perceptivity she relaxed that much more into their company. Friendship was not such a bad thing, she reflected. Perhaps as much risk as it brought to the ruse, it could bring at least that much comfort as well. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.